Welcome back everybody. So you're thinking about buying a home here in Denver, either because you're relocating or you're moving within the city limits. If you're curious to hear about my tips and ideas on how you can successfully do that in today's seller's market, stick around because I'm going to get into that next. Let's go. Welcome to the channel. If this is your first time here, my name is Bill Knapp. I'm a residential realtor, and this is my show, Living in South Denver, where I cover all different kinds of topics about what it's like to buy real estate in this area, what it's like living here, parks, places, things to do, whatever it is, whatever you happen to be doing, I'm gonna try and touch on that throughout various points throughout each one of my shows. Now, I'm sure you've probably heard either from reading your own research or talking to people you know in the area or wherever you find your details that Denver's market is busy and moving fast and it has high prices. And all of that is true. Yes, absolutely. As of today, shooting this time of the video. Now, it won't always be that way, um, but we're also not expecting much in the way of a dip. So we're expecting more of a balance. So to prepare you when you're going out looking for homes, here's a couple of ideas that I highly recommend you do in addition to getting started. Now, buying a home at any price point is a huge undertaking. It can be stressful, it can be exciting, and there's a ton of information that goes into it. As of right now, the Denver market is moving pretty fast. Days on market is sitting roughly about a week or so, sometimes up to two weeks, depending on price points. Because of COVID, our showing windows are shortened. So some places are only allowing you to look at a property for 15 minutes to 30 minutes, which is not a lot of time when you're making a purchase in the hundreds of thousands of dollars category. So it's, it just kind of blows my mind that people are gonna roll into a property that's for, you know $500,000, which is roughly the average price of Denver right now, see it for 15 minutes and be like, yeah, totally, it's mine, let's buy it, boom. You need some preparation, at least I recommend you get some preparation to make sure that whatever you're buying you are absolutely in love with and that you don't have to worry about buyer's remorse or if you paid too much. So to help out with that, some of the obvious items I'm sure you've read about either through your own research or heard about from your friends or people that have purchased recently are a couple of must-haves and then some ideas that I highly recommend that'll help set you up for success as you get going. The first and foremost is you really need to set up what you want as your monthly budget. And to do that, you need to talk to a lender. Ideally, if you're moving to Colorado from another state or if you're moving from within Colorado, it's really best to work with a local lender primarily because they're familiar with the market conditions and how fast things are going, what the current trends are, and chances are strong you're gonna reach them on the nights and weekends when we're typically out looking at properties. It's not saying you can't work with something like uh, a banker that you know from back home, or if you have a great relationship with somebody, you know, financial institution, it just really helps your chances when you work with a local lender for the reasons I stated before. Now, when you start talking to your lender, what you really should ask them is, what will my monthly payment be? Don't go based on the pre-approval or what you're pre-authorized for, because that's, that's fantastic. I'm sure you're probably pre-approved or pre-authorized for a ton of money, which is great but you really don't need to spend that. The, the main thing you wanna watch out for is what can you afford on a monthly basis? And that includes your principal, your interest, your taxes, and your insurance. The lender will talk to you primarily about your principal and your interest because that's what they have the most influence and control over. Your insurance is gonna be tied in with some of your negotiations or talking with your, uh, your lender as well. And then the taxes is variable depending on where you buy. All four of those together line up and add up to what your monthly payment will be for your property. In addition to that, some places have HOAs. And in some neighborhoods like in Highlands Ranch, you might have two HOAs. You'll have a community HOA plus a subdivision HOA. Those come on on top of your actual PITI payments. So it's very important that you set yourself up with a really good baseline monthly budget, work with your lender on what that is, and then move forward with your purchase from there because that will dictate how much you can afford in a home. The next thing you want to talk to your lender about is your down payment. And there's really no set rule on how much you have to have for a down payment. Uh, I've seen people put as little as 3% down. I've seen 5%, 10%, 15, 20, whatever. Whatever is your fit, whatever is the best for your financial fit, I recommend talking with your lender to see what that will do for your, your monthly payment and go with that. 
Now, in our current market, having more down payment tends to help your offer versus a lower down payment, but it's not absolutely necessary. I've had people this year get into a property with 5% down on a conventional loan. We beat out 20% down because our price or because our terms and our conditions were better or a various number of other reasons, but you don't need to have 20 or 25%. You can still do it with five or 10%. You may not get your offer accepted on the first time through. It might just require a little bit of extra patience, but you will get an offer accepted. The next piece is that you really should be working with a realtor, somebody that is proficient in the area where you're searching and ideally somebody that can give you good advice and consult and that is really good on communicating, you know, not only hearing what you want to purchase, but also communicating back to you on what you can expect each step of the way because you don't want to jump into something and not realize that there was a, a broken foundation or an issue with the property. A good realtor will walk you through the place and help you each step of the way. Okay, so now you have a lender in place, let's say, and you've talked to a realtor and you like them and everything's looking good. And you're gonna move forward with both of those people. You have a down payment in mind that you wanna work with, and now you have a, an approximate price range that you wanna go after. Next up you wanna do is start looking at neighborhoods, areas, regions, figure out where you're going to be working, what your commute's gonna look like, and if you have kids, what kind of school district you'd like to be in, and start at a top level. Go like 30,000 feet up and work your way down to figure out where your idea ideal setting is going to take place. Now your realtor can probably help you out not only with providing ideas on neighborhoods to start looking at, but they should also get you connected to the multiple listing service or the MLS. Um, at Compass we have a thing called a Compass Collection which is fantastic. There's a two-way portal where we can communicate on a, in real time. So if I send you a property you can send me a text right back through the app and it says you know I want to see this property. I'll be like hey great let's go out and see that property. Make the request, boom, we go check it out. Now as you're driving around looking at properties Properties. It's great to see them whenever is accessible for you during the day, whether your work schedule, you know, mid-afternoon, early evenings, etc., whatever. Once you've seen the property, if you're liking it, you want to move on it, that's great. Have your realtor get started on writing up the offer, communicating with the listing agent. My big tip for you as a buyer is go back and view the neighborhood in the early afternoon to early evening so you can get a sense of what that place feels like. The, essentially, it's the, the vibe and the pulse of the neighborhood to see if you're liking what's there because you want to make sure that not only is the house your fit, but is the area truly your fit. And along the lines while you're out there looking at the property, either for the second visit or if it's your first go through, make sure you consider which direction the house faces. If it's a north facing home versus a south facing home can be two totally polar different experiences during the winter. As snow falls and lands here, it will stay on the north face of your driveway a lot longer than it will on the southern. Same thing with east and west. Typically the eastern driveways will melt off quite a bit faster than you'll see on the western side. So if you're coming in from a place like Arizona or California or Texas and you're just not used to snow and ice and what it's like to shovel or work with a snowblower, you may consider looking for a southern or an eastern facing home to kind of take down on that learning curve when it comes to the winters here. And the final piece that I'll give you when you're you know, getting all your prep work together uh, before you start actually going in and, and getting your offers submitted is to go with your gut. When you're looking with your realtor and you're going through neighborhoods or you're shopping online, photos are wonderful, but they don't tell the true story of the place. You need to go see the place. And once you see it, if it's lining up with all your expectations, then you'll know, you're like, you almost get like all the feels and your gut will tell you, yeah, this is the place for me. Let's move forward on the offer. In contrast, if you're going after a place and you get in and you've been looking for a while or if it's the first one and you're like, oh, you know, it's just not for me or it's got like seven out of the 10 things I'm looking for, you really shouldn't force a square peg into a round hole. It just won't work. If it's bugging you when you're looking at the home now, it's going to bug you probably 10 years from now or five years from now or however long you stay in the place, whatever that timeline looks like, go with your gut. You'll know when you find your fit. So now that you've got your realtor in place, your lender in place, and you're out shopping for properties, let's say you find the place that's your fit. Fantastic. It's time to put an offer in. What does that look like? Here's a couple of tips for you. Uh, a lot of people will ask, can I submit a love letter with my offer so that way I can create a personal connection between myself and the seller? And in years prior, I would say, absolutely, let's make that happen. Today, we're not supposed to do that, and I don't advise you do that primarily because most sellers won't show it to their, or most listing agents won't sell it to their sellers. And buyer's agents, it can put them in a bit of a sticky situation because it creates a fair housing issue. 
If you put a picture of yourself or identification of yourself based on read, culture, color, whatever your interest is, you could even just be a generic letter saying that you love flying model airplanes and the person on the sell side sees that and hates it or doesn't like it and they reject your offer, it could be seen as discriminatory, so love letters off the table. The next tip when submitting an offer, and this question comes up a lot, is using an escalation clause. And most people will ask, what is that? In a nutshell, an escalation clause is when you say a property is listed at 400,000 and you're gonna offer 410,000, but you don't wanna miss out when somebody might submit an offer slightly higher than yours by 1,000 or 2,000. So you put in an escalation clause saying, I will submit an offer of 410,000 with an escalation clause to go up over the next nearest bona fide offer up to the amount of $440,000 or $1,000 over the next verified bona fide offer, no limit. And that's entirely up to you. That is a strategic play for the buy side. Some listing agents will not allow escalation clauses, uh, some will. The good is it could get you a property. It could actually push you over the limit and have you win by just going $1,000 over. It's kind of like playing the price is right, but with a lot, a lot of real money. The downside is sometimes selling agents don't show you the bona fide offer and technically they don't really have to. So it's a bit of a gamble and you're putting all of your cards on the table. If you're pre-approved up to, if you're going on a $400,000 home and you're pre-approved to $500,000 and you submit a pre-approval letter that says that and you say, I will escalate from 410,000 up to the highest offer received over that by 1,000, you could be paying a heck of a lot more than you want to, which may totally blow your monthly budget. That's where I have a love-hate relationship with these clauses. If you want to use them, I have plenty of tips on how to advise the best way to utilize them. My strong suggestion is go in with your highest and best and make sure that your realtor has a good rapport with the listing agent. So that way there can be a dialogue to see if you're short or close, maybe there's an opportunity to resubmit an offer if the seller is allowing that. Keeping with that theme, if you go into a property and you offer over the list price, your lender is only gonna lend the amount on what the property is appraised for. If it falls short of whatever the property, of whatever your offer was, that creates what's called an appraisal gap. And you typically, as the buyer, are gonna to have to make up the difference between wherever the appraisal fell to, to what your offer price was, if you do a waiver for your appraisal. It's not required that you do that, but a lot of people, like for example, there was a property where I was representing a buyer, they went 50,000 over list price. Seller wanted the whole gap to be covered should it fall short from an appraisal, which meant that my buyer would have to pay that out of pocket. They went for it, we were lucky, there was no appraisal gap. I've talked to other realtors who have had the inverse of that story where it's not only fallen short, it's fallen below where the house was listed, which can be extremely problematic if you waive the appraisals. Now, the next step in this will be once you get under contract, you're going to get the property inspected. This is absolutely important. A lot of sellers in the market right now are requesting limited inspections or no inspection. That's entirely up to you if you want to go that route. I really personally do not advise that because there's a lot of moving parts in a home and it puts you at a tremendous risk. So what I've seen most happen is people will go in and say they either limit the inspection to health safety structural or they'll, or they'll get it inspected, but they won't ask for anything. And that's entirely up to you. Whatever is your competency level on understanding a property or your fit for that area, that, that's fine. A couple of things on that note, when you're looking at a property, there are some major issues to look out for inside of the homes in Colorado. And a good realtor will advise you on each one of these, but the ones you wanna watch out for that are the big ones are the foundation. You wanna make sure that it's structurally sound, it's in good shape. You also wanna look out for radon, which is a naturally occurring colorless, odorless gas that occurs in the entire state of Colorado. Builds up in basements, you need a radon mitigation system. Um, sewer lines are no joke. Sewer lines can be the make or break point for a lot of properties. It takes $150 to get your line scoped and it is an absolute assurance that what you're looking at either is either perfect and in place or it needs a correction. Another item that comes up on inspections is the electric panel or the electric breaker box. There are two companies to keep your eyes open for. One is called Zinsco, the other one is the Federal Pacific Electric, FPE. 
The reason these are important is that both companies were involved in a class action lawsuit in 2002 which required that uh, either a recall of the panel or replacement of the panel due to shock and or fire hazards, which means they are no good for you. Definitely make sure that that is checked when you're doing your home inspection. Another tip to consider when you're pulling your offer together and before you sign and submit over to the seller for review is to put together something called a post-closing occupancy agreement, which is an agreement between you and the seller where they will stay in the home that you just purchased for a period of time based on what you and the seller agree upon. It's pretty common for the seller to ask for three days with no rent or up to seven days with a prorated rent or rent free. That's entirely up to you and the seller, but it, it makes it life easier for the seller. There's a stronger likelihood that that term may be just enough to get your offer accepted in this market. And then one final piece as a final tip to take away. When you're in the transaction, as you're going through the inspection and the appraisal process, your lender is going to have some requests of you. My big tip for you is please listen to your lender and get them whatever information they're requesting as soon as possible because the lender has to get all that information over to their underwriter. Underwriter has to make sure that your file is simple and complete and done so they can get you your closing disclosure. If you run behind on any of those pieces at all, there's a strong chance that your closing will get delayed. You may run into some issues where you run up against your loan uh, objection timeline. That's one of your last outs in the state of Colorado where you can protect your earnest money and it just creates a lot of unnecessary stress. So I highly recommend do your due diligence. If your lender calls you and wants something, do whatever you have to do to get them those details. It also makes my job easier as a buyer's agent and it'll help out with the listing side because everybody is just on the same page. Hopefully some of this information was helpful or you picked up a nugget or a detail that you didn't already know about. If you liked what you heard or there was something helpful that came out of this video, if you could do me a favor, hit that like button, maybe that bell notification so you can get notified each time I put out a new video. And if you wanna be super awesome, subscribe because it really helps me with the algorithm. If you have questions on anything I put out there at all today, just drop me a comment below. I'll get to it as soon as I can or you can give me a call or a text. I am the one that answers all this information. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love even more to see if I can be the fit to help you in buying your property here in Denver. Thanks so much for sticking around this long. I'm Bill Knapp with Compass in Denver. This is Living in South Denver and I'll see you on the next one. Take care.